In the 5th century BCE, a nameless woman travelled to the city of Sparta and was astonished by what she saw. Unlike the proto-democracy of Athens, where all could vote, provided they were land-owning free men of a certain age, the women of Sparta, Pariethen Ukeienus, held themselves aloft. The woman, having observed this in a land veiled by a mirage in which men trained from childhood to become godlike killing machines, came to a certain conclusion. And she brought this conclusion to Gorgo, the queen of Sparta herself, wife of Leonidas, the martyr of Thermopylae. Monai ton andron arkete humeis hai lakainai, she said. The only ones who rule their men are you, the Spartan women. Now this little anecdote is significant for more than one reason. Spartan women held quite a distinguished role in their society, differing from quite a few other contemporary Greek states. They trained alongside the men, received a good education in the arts and humanities, and, provided they were of noble birth, held considerable sway in Spartan politics. But in this video, I'm going to go right back to the origins of Sparta, and show that from then until today, it has been perpetually rooted around feminine power. So, to the very, very beginning. The first king of what we'd now consider to be Sparta was an indigenous man named Lelex. His own origins are shrouded in mystery. He may have risen from the ground itself. He may have been the son of Helios or Poseidon. He may even have had mortal parents, though, as we all know, that is highly unlikely. And so the first documented people of this land were the Lelegies. Lelex married the sea nymph Cleocharia, establishing the rulers of the land as one, perhaps even two, divine beings, if Lelex was in fact the son of a god. The throne was eventually passed down to their son, Miles. Now around this time, there was another sea nymph in the land, a companion of Artemis and the daughter of Atlas, the Pleiad called Daiete. She was revered and worshipped by the local Lelegies as the Botnia Theron, the Queen of Animals, and the great mountain in which she lived was known henceforth as Mount Theatos, which would forever be part of Spartan culture. Needless to say she was beautiful, and needless to say this caught the eye of none other than creepy old Zeus, who winged his way down towards her, and despite Artemis' protection, did his dirty deed, through which she conceived a son, Lacedaemon. Now some of you might think, I know that name, he must be the guy Sparta is named after. Well, if so, you would be half right. You see, King Miles passed down the kingdom to his own son, Eurotas, who presumably, on his deathbed, had no male heirs. So what he did was marry his daughter off to Lacedaemon, giving him the Lelegian throne, who better than the son of Daite and Zeus themselves. So Lacedaemon became king, and his kingdom became known as Lacedaemonia. But his wife, the daughter of Eurotas, well, guess what her name was? None other than Sparta. And so influential was she, either with the people, her husband or both, that the capital of Lacedaemonia was named Sparta in her honour. And as we all know, one name lasted much longer than the other. While Lacedaemonians and Spartans were often interchangeable terms in antiquity, posterity has by and large favoured Sparta in the end. So after it's all said and done, this mighty nation of warrior men are really the product of a rich ancestry of divinely powerful women. Who'd have thought, eh? Maybe, just maybe, we should be thinking of Sparta as a feminine powerhouse of the ancient Greek city-states, as well as the land of abs and biceps. <laughs> 